Welcome to our second video uh, over winter break, and this is with regards to our second uh, n problem number two on 2004 Form B uh, on the BC exam. I, if I had to rank our four problems in in order from hardest to easiest, I would rank this one as the second hardest one we've got for the break, so uh, let's jump right into it. So as I settled into the part A here, I, it, was, it was just a what would Taylor do type of question. And so I took a few extra seconds and I wrote out the first three terms of Taylor's um, uh, polynomial here centered at 2 and so that I could match up the corresponding terms here. So for, for the first one, if we want to find f of 2, that's simply the very first term straight up, no bones about it. So I matched it up and I said it's clearly f of 2 has a value of 7. Now the second one gets a little more interesting um, what we're going to do is, the you'll notice up here in the polynomial, there is no first degree term. That's a missing term, which is going to play a role in part B. So this one pretty much got deleted. But then we could match up this term here and set it equal to this term here. Do not lose that negative sign. So we're saying Taylor says it should be the second derivative evaluated at 2 divided by 2 factorial x minus 2 quantity squared, and we'll set that equal to the negative 9 quantity x minus 2 squared. Now if we did this correctly, what should happen every single time? This rascal should cancel out with this rascal every single time if we did it correctly. So basically all we're going to do is take our 2 factorial, multiply it to the other side, and we can say that the second derivative evaluated at 2 is equal to negative 18. Now, an interesting one, why don't, I'm going to pose an extra twist here. If they wanted the third derivative evaluated at 2, could we get it? All right, let's challenge ourselves a little bit here. If they wanted the third derivative, Taylor says it's going to be the third derivative divided, uh, evaluated at 2 divided by 3 factorial, and I'm going to set it equal to the coefficient I saw there in the problem, and that was negative 3. So I would say the third derivative evaluated at 2 is... Let's see, 6 times negative 3. Is that negative 18 as well? How about that? Humdinger. But anyway, that's how we'd go about it, and uh, I think that's a, a quick little question we need to continue to work out. Now, in order to jump on part B here, we've got to at least, we have to first of all know the definition of a critical point. What is a critical point? Well, here's a quick definition to put in your, your notes or your memory bank here. A uh, function will have a critical point whenever the first derivative is, whoops, the first derivative of x is equal to zero or whenever the first derivative is undefined, okay? And a quick note there, we do not need to confirm that f prime changes signs, okay? We do not need to prove that f prime changes signs. That's just if you wanted to prove whether there's a max or a min. So that's being more specific than we need to be. I just need to know if either this or this happens. You notice we, we said right here there was a missing term. And the reason there's a missing term is because that coefficient is zero and we could say yes, f prime uh, of 2 is equal to 0 because of the missing term up there. And now they want us to say if that's true, is there a max, is there a min, or neither? We cannot make a sign chart. We cannot use the first derivative test. But what we can do is rely on our answer from part A where we said the second derivative evaluated at 2 was negative 18, clearly being negative. Therefore, f is concave down. Therefore, f is concave down at x equals 2. If you want a quick visual picture, here's what we've created. We know we're concave down. We know there's a horizontal tangent line. And therefore, the second derivative test guarantees the existence of a relative maximum at x equals 2. So we're going to use t of x to find an approximation for f of 0. So we're going to say f of 0 is approximately, and make sure we don't throw an equals right there. Um, it's approximately t of 0, and t of 0 is equal to 7 minus, let's see, we got 9, 0 minus 2 squared minus 3, quantity 0 minus 2 cubed. Did a little number crunching there, and we could say that f of 0 is approximately, let's see, I ended up with negative 5. Okay, so there's the first half. Now, can we say with confidence whether or not f has a critical point at x equals 0? I mean, it appears not. I mean, we didn't get, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't get 0 for an answer here. But the key here is, is we have to say that we don't have enough information. Not enough info. And here's why. All right. T of x can supply exact information about x equals 2, 
but it's only an approximation for all other values of f. Okay, so what we need to say is that this third degree polynomial only, although it does a very good job, only approximates f of x. So, again, I'll, I'll reiterate that the, this polynomial can supply exact information about x equals 2 because that's where it's centered at. But other than that, if you wander away from 2, either to the left or the right, it's only an approximation now. Now, we've been hustling through these first three parts so that we could get to part D and tap the brakes a little bit and really do some quality work on Lagrange's airbound. And right off the bat, we want to remind ourselves, you know, what is his magical crazy formula? And he says that your maximum error is guaranteed to be smaller than... The first thing we do is we take the n plus first derivative and we evaluate it as some mysterious number called z. We divide by n plus 1 factorial. And then we also multiply by x minus c raised to the n plus 1 power. And so what I want to do here briefly is I want to define each of those crazy letters and see if we can't sort them out a little better. First of all, n is the degree of the polynomial that you use for approximation. Um, you'll notice in part C, we used a third degree polynomial, so we're going to define n as being 3. C is where the polynomial is centered at. Our last polynomial was clearly centered at 2, so we'll let C be 2. Now, X is sometimes overlooked. X is actually the value that we are attempting to approximate. So again, in part C, they wanted us to approximate f of 0, so we're going to let x be 0. And then last but not least, the most interesting character in the bunch, z, is some mysterious number. There's a lot of times we'll never even actually know who z is, and that doesn't, and, and I guess we have to get used to not letting that bother us. And it's, in this case, it's going to be between um, c and x. All right, and we could um, turn this inequality around so that it was x less than or equal to z less than or equal to c, as long as he's bounded by those two crazy numbers. And here's the kicker. It's a number that makes the n plus first derivative as big as possible, because we're always interested in up here in creating the worst case scenario, making the error as, as big as possible, so at the end of the day we can say we know for sure that it's not worse than this. So we've, here we are, finally, ready to really tackle part D. And we're going to jump into Lagrange, but I want to quickly identify. We already said that we're going to let n equal 3 because we used a third-degree polynomial for our approximation. We said we're centered at 2. Those are the obvious ones. Um, we attempted to approximate f of 0, so we will let x be 0. And then last but not least, z is going to be some mysterious number between 0 and 2 that makes our n plus first derivative as big as possible. So Lagrange says the maximum error is going to be less than or equal to, let's see, uh, let's say the fourth derivative evaluated at z divided by 4 factorial, and then we'll have 0 minus 2 raised to the fourth power. All right, now, here's the fun part. You're wondering, what in God's green earth are we going to do with this rascal? Well, check this out up here. They promised me that the fourth derivative is never going to get bigger than 6 within, coincidence, huh? Coincidence? Between the interval 0 to 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a 6 to substitute in for that quantity right there. And we can now say that our maximum error is less than, let's see, 6 over 4 factorial times, let's see, negative 2 to the 4th would be 16. By the time I get done cleaning that all up, I got a value of 4. So what that means is we could be, up by, we could be off by 4 units on either side of our approximation. So we're kind of creating this window or this interval where our real value has to lie within. Now if you recall in part C, hopefully, um, we, we, we said that f of 0 was approximately negative 5. So we could be off in either direction. So the real f of 0 lies within the interval negative 9. Let's see, all the way up to negative 1 is where, that's where it really lies. And so we've proven that f of 0 has to be negative 
Um, and that's what they're really asking us to do here at the end of that sentence. You could see they're asking us to prove that it's negative, and that clearly does. So hopefully you feel a little better about Lagrange. And um, the only other alternative when we talk about error is we could have a separate discussion on the alternating series and where we just simply grab the next term and there's no mysterious Z value to worry about. We just go straight for the next term, um, and that's a little simpler. So we'll talk to you soon.